This lecture will present an introduction to co-localization. As a core director uh, of an imaging core facility, this is a myth that I frequently run into, that co-localization analysis is easy. But the reality when you do co-localization analysis is more like this. So you will need to make many decisions under uncertain conditions when you do a co-localization analysis. It's very easy to press a few buttons in many software packages and to get numbers associated with something called co-localization, but there are a lot of decisions that you have to make either explicitly or implicitly to get there. Uh, for the rest of this talk, whenever this forked uh, road sign will appear, those indicate that these are places where you will need to make decisions about how to execute either the data acquisition, the data pre-processing, or the analysis. Um, there's a first problem with co-localization, which is what are we even talking about? Um, and the reason for this is that co-localization is a very loaded term. It's used in many different contexts when asking many different questions. So let me show you a few examples of this so that you can uh, get a sense of what someone might be talking about or what you might be um, discussing when you're using the term co-localization. So there's the first version of this, which is uh, related to the question, are cells of type X and Y in tissue area Z? And so you can imagine a tissue with a, with a certain anatomical region called Z, and you have cells of type X and Y in that region. And um, under these circumstances, you might say, say that cells X and Y co-localize in area Z. So this is one uh, way in which people use this word of co-localization. Another uh, way in that people frequently use this term is when they're asking how many cells are of a certain type, let's say A. And let's say A is defined by the expression of two markers, X and Y. So if you imagine that X is a nuclear marker and Y is a cytoplasmic marker, you may be in a situation where you have cells that have one, the other, or both, and you are interested in the ones that have both. Um, note that in this case, the two markers do not overlap inside uh, inside the same particular parts of the cell, but they are both in the same cell. There are other versions of this. For example, one of the markers might be a membrane-bound marker and the other nuclear. One might be in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, while another is only in the nucleus. Or they might both be in the entire cell. And independent of the exact distribution within the cell of the two markers, uh, this is the kind of thing where you typically say that X and Y co-localize in cell type A. Um, another common question where the word co-localization comes up is whether protein A is in subcellular organelle X. So in this case, you may have a protein that is um, everywhere in the cytoplasm, but enriched uh, maybe in this organelle. You have another, uh, in another channel, a marker for that specific organelle. And you can see that uh, protein A is enriched in that, sub, in that organelle X. And so in this case, you can say that protein A co-localizes with organelle X. Um, another very common question that comes up is when people are trying to figure out if protein A and protein B interact. And there's a diffraction limited version of this experiment where people may look at protein A, and in this case, I've illustrated protein A as having a very low level in the cytoplasm, enriched in the nucleus, and then very enriched uh, and at different concentrations in these sort of nuclear puncta you may want to compare that to a protein B, which is only in those puncta, and say something about uh, the correlation of the intensities. So maybe when uh, protein B is really high in intensity, protein A is also high, and maybe that can give you a clue as to whether they're interacting or not. There's a super resolution version of this kind of experiment where you look at the positions of individual molecules inside a structure. Here I've crudely illustrated something like a synapse, uh, and then you look at that for both uh, proteins are both markers, and you see that uh, if the distribution of them uh, is, is, is somehow correlated, they're co-distributed, or, or like one does not look like it's, it's random with respect to the other, in those cases you can also say that protein A and B are co-localized. Now, a very important point is that while you know, this question of whether two proteins interact is a very common one, uh, co-localization analysis cannot prove that two proteins interact. So why not? Well, the reason is you need to have uh, a sense of the resolution um, of an image to interpret the term co-localization. So if we, we think of one extreme where the entire universe is one voxel, so one three-dimensional pixel, so if that were the um, 
uh, the situation, then everything co-localizes because it's all in that same voxel. On the other extreme, we can think of a situation uh, when we look at things at the atomic level. So this, for example, is from a paper where they looked at the interaction of the COVID spike protein uh, with fragments of antibodies that recognize them. And there's no doubt there, um, based on that paper, that these things are interacting, yet the atoms are not overlaid. And that's because at that scale, really nothing co-localizes. That's Pauli's exclusion principle, which in other words states um, that two things cannot be in the same place at the same time. So even at the atomic level, if things are interacting, that doesn't mean that they're in the same place. And so light microscopy explores things somewhere in between these two extreme scenarios. And different kinds of light microscopy explore it at different resolutions or different length scales. So for example, this is from a paper where they compared um, confocal uh, laser scanning microscopy, uh, confocal plus deconvolution, and 3D structured illumination microscopy. And they were looking at the nucleus and specifically at the nuclear pore complex shown here in red and a protein called lamin. And so if you look at this with a standard confocal, you can see that there's some overlap. Uh, there's less overlap if you um, run the data through an algorithm called deconvolution, which restores um, uh, the data somewhat. And then uh, if you look at it with 3D structured illumination microscopy, which is a super resolution technique, you see that things that seem like they were overlapping when you looked at them with a confocal with this higher resolution microscopy, they're close to each other, but they're not actually overlapping. And so the level of resolution that you use to look at a structure, uh, that will affect um, your interpretation of this uh, term of co-localization. So in standard microscopy, if you look at something, you know, a, a green marker and a red marker, a green protein, a red protein, or so proteins labeled with fluorophores of those colors, you might see a lot of overlap in yellow. But if you increase the resolution, you'll see that a lot of yellow actually was because things were nearby, but not really overlapping. And so remember, co-localization does not imply interaction. At the molecular level, there's really no such thing as co-localization, again, because two things can't be in the same place at the same time. And so really, the statements that you're making at best are that two molecules are within a certain distance of each other. And that distance is given by the resolution of the technique that you're using to look at them. And so the analogy that I like to present as something useful is that interaction would be uh, if I am shaking someone's hand and co-localization analysis can't really speak to that. All it can say is it can place uh, that person and myself in the same room, on the same floor of the same building or in the same building, depending on the level of resolution of microscopy that was used to generate the image. So uh, let me present some basic nomenclature that's consistent with the current, uh, as of sort of you know May of 2024, uh, kind of generally accepted way of calling the things that I showed you before in the in the literature. So the first scenario where you have two markers uh, in a cell of uh, uh, and that the the when they're both there, that is a cell of a certain type is called co-expression, is referred to as co-expression. When you have um, you know, one protein that you're trying to see if it's in the same location as a marker, for example, for an organelle, you call that co-occurrence. If you're trying to see if the levels of one of the things that you're looking at are correlated with the levels of the other, you call that uh, correlation. And if you're trying to see if uh, individual localizations have some degree of, 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 of some relationship that suggests that they're not random, that's typically called co-distribution. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on co-occurrence and correlation, not because the others are not important and interesting things, but just because uh, in my experience, most of the co-localization analysis that people uh, do take place within these two categories. And so before you can even do any kind of co-localization uh, co analysis, you need good data to start. And so you need to make decisions about how you're going to acquire that data. And there are many decisions that you need to make, and you have to consider different things. So the first one is, which fluorophores are you going to use to mark the things that you're interested in? And so the main consideration there is to minimize spectral overlap. You can't have fluorophores that overlap a lot because then you won't be able to tell them apart. Um, and you might conclude that they're overlapping, not because they're in the same place, but actually because one fluorophore is bleeding into your detection of the other. Um, another uh, common decision that you need to make is whether to use a wide field or a confocal microscope. And there the consideration is whether you have a lot of uh, um, things out of focus 
and whether that light is bleeding into the planes that you are looking at at a given moment, and uh, that can, you know causes issues. And so, depending on how three-dimensional your sample is and how uh, the flow force are distributed within that sample, one of these techniques might be more appropriate than the other. You also have to decide which objective lens you're going to use, and this is the thing that's going to define the resolution of your image, and you really want to optimize that resolution for your question. If you're looking at subcellular objects, you're going to use a certain kind of objective, whereas if you're just looking to see whether two things are in the nucleus of a cell, you can probably get away with a lower numerical aperture objective that has less resolution. So another question is which filters to use. <clears throat> and so this is the things that are in front of whatever your detection apparatus is. And um, they carve up the emission spectrum of the things that are coming out of the sample. And so you need to do that in a way that, again, you minimize spectral overlap. If you're using a microscope in a core facility, it's very likely that this will have been done with for you. At least that's the case in, in our core facility. But if you're using your own microscope, you want to make sure um, that you do this in a way to minimize that spectral overlap. Um, you also have to make a decision as to whether you're going to acquire channels sequentially or simultaneously. So sometimes you can acquire multiple channels at once, but that has risks because if you excite multiple channels at once, what can happen is there is a, a higher likelihood that the emission from one channel is going to end up in the detection channel um, in the detection channel for something else. So um, Another thing that you have to uh, consider is whether you're going to do 3D or 2D imaging. And so the thing to uh, keep into account when you're when trying to make that decision is how are things distributed in Z? So if things are distributed non-uniformly in Z, you may want to capture that with some sort of three-dimensional Z stack image. Uh, if they're random or if you or if just one plane of the cell is as representative as any other, you may prefer to do a single plane imaging because that's going to be more efficient. So if you take a single plane, you'll be able to take a single plane image of many more cells. Uh, if you take a 3D stack of images, you will only be able to do that for fewer cells. Um, if you're doing 3D imaging of live samples, there's sort of two ways that you can do that. You can take images of channels first and then take different Zs or images of the different Z planes and then take images of different channels. And so one or the other would be more appropriate, uh, mainly depending on how fast things are moving in that live sample. So you don't want any smearing. Um, so really that's going to de determine whether you can do one or the other. And as always, when you're taking images, you will need to balance speed and quality. And so really you need to figure out how much signal to noise do you need in your final image to do your analysis. Um, and so then you can try and go based on that as fast as possible. Now, once you make those acquisition decisions, it is highly advisable to test them. So you make a decision based on your, your best judgment, but it's, it's good to test that judgment to see whether you made a good decision. And so there are some basic controls and things that you can try. You can try a fluorescence minus one control. So you do all the fluorophores except one, and you acquire an image with exactly the same settings as for your full experiment. And you can see in, in the channel that detects the fluorophore that's missing, is there any signal? Are any of the other channels uh, bleeding into that um, to that one? Uh, another thing that's really useful is to do a no staining control to see what are the background levels, perhaps due to autofluorescence or non-specific binding, um, of 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 all the channels. Subresolution beads can be very very important uh, if they're labeled with multiple fluorophores because this will give you a very precise estimate of whether there are something called chromatic aberrations in XYZ. So sometimes uh, microscopes will not focus the light from different wavelengths in exactly the same positions in XYZ across the entire field. And so if you're making very precise measurements, uh, this is highly advisable to make sure that things um, that you know where things end up if you know that they are actually the same thing. So a sub-resolution bead with multiple fluorophores, the image in all the channels in all the dimensions should be that they should localize to the same spot. And if they don't, that tells you you have chromatic aberrations, which you need to deal with later. Um, you also need to uh, try 3D versus a single slice. And this will actually tell you explicitly whether the distribution in Z of the things that you're looking at is random, um, and whether a single slice will capture uh, the behavior of what you're looking at just as well uh, as a three-dimensional image, which is more costly to acquire in time. Um, you can also try different imaging speeds, if, particularly if you're looking at live samples, to see whether there's any 2D or 3D smearing 
within channels or between channels. Uh, again, that depends on the speed at which you're imaging related to the speed at which the things in your sample uh, might be moving. You can also try different quality settings. So uh, this is a very loose term that I'm using here, but in different kinds of microscopy, there are things that you can do to increase the contrast of the image. Uh, and so how much contrast, uh, for example, do you need for a robust analysis? Uh, obviously, the images, if they're very noisy, your results are going to be very noisy, but you don't want to go uh, in the other direction of, of getting uh, spending a lot of time uh, for very little benefit that doesn't really affect um, your, uh, your results and, uh, and the quality of the analysis. So um, the thing I want to emphasize here is as you make acquisition decisions and then you test them, you can go back and make acquisition decisions again and then test them again. And you sort of have to iterate to optimize. It's very unlikely that you're going to get this right on the first try. So really, this process of um, optimization by iteration is, is critical to having good results. So once you get the data, then you typically have to make pre-processing decisions. And so there are many ways in which you can take the data and pre-process it. You might do spectral and mixing if you have uh, heavily overlapping fluorophores. Uh, this is complicated, but sometimes you don't have a choice and you have to um, um, take this on. You might need to make chromatic corrections based on beads if you uh, want to make very, very precise measurements. This is essential. Uh, you might need to do something called flat fielding if the illumination of the, of the field of view is uneven, which is uh, typically the case in many wide field microscopes. You may want to do a background subtraction, and that can either be a global one um, or a local background subtraction if the background is uneven. Um, and so this, this can often help. And particularly, there are uh, several co-localization metrics, which we'll discuss later, which are very sensitive to whether you have uh, done background subtraction properly or not. Um, you may want to do some, some basic denoising techniques or even something fancier called deconvolution, which can be done if you're using three-dimensional data, and it helps restore uh, the image. And again, once you make pre-processing decisions, uh, you don't just trust that you did that correctly. You have to figure out, you know, you have to test those pre-processing decisions and say, well, how does the data change? And how do the results of the analysis change? And, and if things went in a direction that doesn't make any sense, you have to go back and reevaluate your pre-processing decisions. So let's assume that you did get good data. So how do you analyze it? Once you have the data, what do you do with it? So there, there's sort of two levels of analysis. The first thing I'll describe is sort of a quick checks of what might be going on. And one quick check that you can do is look uh, at yellowness. If you have one channel in red, another in green, you can look at, its, at their overlap in the XY plane. And it can, you can also look at the overlap in the XZ or YZ planes if you have Z stacks. And you can see, well, how much yellow is there? The idea being that where there's yellow, it uh, it shows an overlap of the red and green channel. And so this comes from a review by Dunn and colleagues from 2011, where uh, in the top three panels, they had transferrin labeled with two fluorophores, a red one and a green one. And since it's, it's essentially the same molecule labeled with two fluorophores, as expected, uh, you can see that wherever there are, there's red signal, there's also green signal, and they overlap almost perfectly, which you can see in the, in the panel on the left. Uh, contrast that to the situation where they label transferrin with a red fluorophore and dextran with a green fluorophore. Um, these are two molecules that traffic through different pathways in the cell. And so in that case, what you can see is that they don't overlap at all. There's very little yellow in the resulting image. Here's another example from a, from a data set from a from a paper that I'm going to discuss in more detail uh, much later. Uh, it was just a collaboration with Jenny Ting's lab at, at UNC, so the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And um, here we have a protein called Sting that's marked in red, a protein called NLRC3 that's marked in green. And you can see in these, in these different images how there's different uh, degrees of, of yellowness. But as you can also see, these are the same image. All I've done here is adjust the contrast. And by adjusting the contrast, I haven't changed the data, but I've certainly changed how it looks. And I can emphasize, you know, I can make things more red, more green, or more yellow. And so the problem with this sort of yellowness check is that it's very easy to manipulate uh, just by adjusting the contrast. And it's, it's quite hard to interpret outside of obvious cases like the one I showed in the previous slide. Uh, furthermore, uh, this red-green um, display mode, uh, while it's very common, it's actually incompatible with color blindness, which is a fairly frequent uh, characteristic. So um, one thing that you can do is instead of using yellowness, you can try 
switching the red to magenta and the overlap will show up in white uh, and again so you can look at sort of whiteness so this is a colorblind friendly version of the of the previous thing I showed you but it has the same problems that it's easy to manipulate and it's hard to interpret outside of obvious cases um, so let's talk about other quick checks that we can uh, do to see what might be going on so uh, another thing that's that's uh, common is to use uh, line profiles <clears throat> Again, either in the XY or XZ or YZ dimension. And so this is a, an example from a paper from 2001 where they were looking at catalase. So this is something that labels peroxisomes, and they had it labeled with a red fluorophore. And then they were studying this protein called HEO1, and they had it tagged with GFP. And what they were studying was different targeting motifs, and they wanted to see if those targeting motifs would send this protein to the peroxisome or not. And so what they would do is... Um, once they had images, they would draw a line across the image and plot the intensity of the pixels across that line in both channels. And you can see that in these cases, uh, where they had these two targeting motifs, uh, there was good overlap in the sort of pattern of intensities um, across the line. Whereas in this one, where they had this mutated targeting motif, there didn't really seem to be good overlap. It's a little bit hard to tell what's going on here, um, but it certainly doesn't look like this. So uh, the problems with this uh, line profile approach is that there's a selection bias. And so where do you draw the line? You're gonna get a different answer if you draw the line here than if you draw it there, or if you draw it here versus there. And so how do you decide where to draw the line? There's really no uh, particularly good answer. It's just an exploratory technique, and you draw it, and you try and get a sense for it, but there's really no systematic way of deciding where to draw those lines. Again, it's hard to interpret outside of obvious cases. Sure, if all the peaks coincide, yeah, I mean, I don't know that that tells you anything that the yellowness wouldn't tell you, uh, but outside of that, it can be hard to uh, interpret it, and it's very hard to quantify this systematically because you can't average these lines um, and so you have to come up with more complicated metrics to try and compare them. So it's really hard to do statistics on this. Um, so again, as a quick check, it can be really useful, uh, but for a more systematic analysis, uh, it falls short. Another uh, thing that can be valuable as a quick check of what might be going on is something called a scatter plot, a corellogram, a fluorogram, or a 2D histogram. And so this is, again, from the same figure I showed you before from this review from Dunn and colleagues from 2011. And the idea is here, you take uh, each pixel, and each pixel will have an intensity in the green channel and an intensity in the red. Those intensities are numbers that go from zero to some limit of the detector. And so you can plot for each of those pixels what the number is in the red pixel, in the red channel and in the green channel. And you get a plot like this, where each dot is comes from one pixel so this has all the pixels in the image and you can see that in this case they're highly correlated and in this case they're not so uh, let's break this down a little bit uh, more conceptually so you can have a good idea of what to expect so if you're plotting green pixel intensity as a function of red pixel intensity you expect that um, there's going to be some noise that's close to the sort of zero point for both of them and then if there's no overlap between red and green, what you expect is that the green pixel intensities range over uh, uh, you know, a, a particular like intensity range. But when you look at those same pixels in the red channel, they're really kind of overlapping with the noise. Uh, at the same time, if the red pixels are not overlapping, what you have is red pixel intensities ranging uh, widely. But for those pixels with the red signal, you know, they mostly overlap with the noise in the green channel. If you have a correlation between the red and green, it'll look like this. If you have a, a situation where you have red and green correlated only in some regions, you'll have a mix of the things we've discussed before. You'll have the noise, you'll have the correlated pixels, and you'll have the pixels that don't overlap. So this can get quite complicated. If you have bleed through from the green channel to the red channel, what happens is as your green pixel intensity goes up, for the very brightest ones, you'll have also a little bit of an increase in the red pixel, red pixel intensity. And similarly, if you have uh, bleed through from red to green, what you see is that as the red pixel intensity goes up, you'll see some of it is leaking into the green channel. And so the green pixel intensity goes up a little bit as well. Um, so the problems with this uh, approach is that uh, first there's an ROI conundrum, which is 
where you do the correlation, so where you, you, you plot this, so what part of the image you use for this makes a huge difference. Um, and so we will discuss that more later, um, both in the um, in this lecture as well as the exercises that are associated with this lecture. Uh, second, you don't always expect a correlation. So uh, if you've marked an organelle with a certain uh, protein and then you're looking at whether another protein is in that organelle, those two things might have intensities that are not necessarily correlated. So the absence of a correlation might not tell you much. And again, outside of obvious cases, these, these, uh, these plots um, uh, can be actually very hard to interpret. So these quick checks are fine, but we need to actually measure something. Um, and so what do we measure? So there are many different metrics you can use. There's a general category of them, which are called pixel-based. And the idea is because they're based on the raw image. And so there's sort of three general things that are, that are used. One is um, intensity correlation. So you look at the intensities of each pixel in the different channels, and you see whether there's a correlation between them. Uh, a second approach is to look at the overlapping fraction of channels. So you see uh, where there is sort of signal above some sort of threshold in one channel and the other, and you see how much overlap there are between those regions. Uh, and then finally, you have intensity cross-correlation, where you can look at sort of the intensity correlation and how it changes if you shift one image relative to the other. Uh, there's a separate category of methods used for co-localization analysis, which are called object-based. And so the idea here is you take your pixels in the raw images and you detect objects based on them. So for example, you might want to detect spots or spheres uh, because maybe those images are of things that you know independently to be uh, foci or puncta in a nucleus. And so you detect these objects. These objects are sort of mathematical abstractions of the data. And then you can work on those objects directly and ask questions like how far is the centroid of each object from each other or how much do their volumes or area if it's a two-dimensional image overlap so for the rest of this lecture i'm going to focus on these uh, the intensity correlation overlapping fraction the reason is not obviously because those are the only methods or these are the best methods or that these are the methods that you should always use it's just that these are fairly well mapped out whereas a lot of the object-based uh, are more bespoke. And, and so there's sort of some standard things that uh, many people do a lot of the time. And a lot of the lessons that you can learn by studying those, you can apply to all the other things that you might come up with as metrics for measuring co-localization. So I'm going to start with intensity correlation methods. And the most commonly used one is called Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is a quantification of that scatter plot that I showed you before. The formula is here, where x sub i is the intensity of pixel number i in channel 1, and y sub i is the intensity of the ith pixel in channel 2. And so uh, this formula might not mean uh, too much to you in its current form, but uh, here are some results to give you a sense of how this how this works. So if this Pearson's correlation coefficient is 1, that means there's a perfectly positive linear correlation between the intensities of both channels. If it's minus 1, it means there's a perfectly negative linear correlation. If it's 0, it means there's no correlation. And the square of this value is the fraction of the variance in channel 2 explained by the variance in channel 1. So here's an example, again, from the review by Dunn and colleagues in 2011, uh, where they looked at, um, they made a scatter plot for the combined region 1, 2, 3 over here. Um, and so you, you can look at the scatter plot and notice that there's two clusters of, of, uh, of points. And this cluster here, you can see, has higher green intensities than this cluster. And so that corresponds, obviously, to this cell, whereas the pixels here correspond to these two other cells. If you measure the Pearson's correlation coefficient on individual cells, you get these values. And if you measure it on the entire image, you get this value. So here you see uh, like this illustrates some of the problems of this uh, method, which is that it's, it's very sensitive to ROI placement. And that includes things like whether you take the cells in the image versus the entire image, whether you take individual cells versus all cells. So both of those here would be a problem because, you know, this cell has a very sort of different shape uh, uh, of, of this correlation plot than these ones. So if you try and get some, some number from all of them, you're, you're sort of mixing things and you might not get a correlation even though there is a correlation in each one. Uh, and also that you have to be careful with specific, specific subcellular regions versus the entire cell. Sometimes 
um, certain parts of a cell may not have the um, one or both of the proteins of interest, and so maybe that doesn't make sense to include in a region of interest. Uh, a problem that's sort of downstream of the fact that this method is very sensitive to region of interest placement is that drawing regions of interest is very hard to automate, and even more so if you try to do it in three dimensions. Uh, furthermore, not every correlation is linear. I'll discuss that in the next slide. And finally, just to reiterate, you don't always expect a correlation. Again, so if you have something that labels, for example, an organelle uh, and something else that is a protein in that organelle, the amounts of those two on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis might not be correlated. So what do you do if the, if the correlation is nonlinear? So if there's a nonlinear intensity relationship between the channels, so this is an example from a review by Aaron and colleagues in 2018 where they had this correlation. So is there a way of sort of linearizing this? Uh, and so it turns out there is. You, you can use something called Spearman's correlation coefficient where it takes the intensities and it ranks them. Uh, and by ranking them, it turns this into this. And so that helps with nonlinear intensity relationships, which there very well could be in many biological cases. But all the other problems from intensity correlation methods remain. So um, it, it solves the, the, the sort of the linearity issue, but everything else, uh, you still have those challenges. So let's switch gears and talk about an overlapping fraction method. I'm specifically going to discuss something called Mander's thresholded coefficients, where you're looking at the fraction of the co-occurring signal. And so the way you do this method is step one, you set thresholds for channel one and channel two, and pixels below those thresholds are basically ignored. How do you do this? If you imagine that x sub i is the intensity of pixel number i in channel one, and y sub i is the intensity of pixel number i in channel two, uh, you set thresholds for x and thresholds for y, uh, and you have a thresholded versions of the versions of the pixels where they are uh, whatever the value was if they are above the threshold and zero if they are equal to or less than the threshold, and that's true for both the the pixel intensities in channel one and two. So step one, you set thresholds. Step two, you calculate uh, M1 and M2. So for example, M1 is going to be the sum of the thresholded pixels that are co-localized co -localized divided by the sum of all thresholded pixels. And so what are the thresholded pixels that are co-localized? So for example, for X, um, you include the pixels uh, if the other channel is above the threshold. So in the end, what you have is the fraction of channel one that is co-occurring with channel two. So of all the intensities that are above threshold in channel one, um, what fraction of those co-occur in pixels where channel two is above threshold? And by analogy, M2 is the fraction of channel two that co-occurs with channel one. Um, so this can get a little bit confusing the first time you encounter these um, uh, these coefficients. So let's uh, work through it with an example, which I think will really help. So imagine you have an image where channel one looks like this. So an image is really a matrix of numbers. Here are the numbers for this particular image on the left. It's a three by three pixel image, so not super interesting, but I think it'll be useful for as an example. And on the right, you can see uh, what that image looks like displayed in magenta. You also have this uh, in this other channel, channel two, the values on the left, those are the intensities. Uh, of each of the pixels, and on the right, you can see the display of that on a green scale. Um, and here is the overlap image uh, with both channels overlap, so you can see a little bit of whiteness where things overlap. So the first step is to set threshold. So if in channel one, we set the threshold to five, we're only going to be interested in the pixels whose intensity is greater than five. If we set the pixel, uh, the threshold for channel two at six, we're only going to be interested in this channel and the pixels that are above that threshold. So those are the pixels that are above the threshold in one and in the other channel. These are the pixels that are co-localized. So that means that they are above the threshold for both channels. And to calculate M1 and M2, we take the sum of the pixels that are co-localized. So in this case, that's 14 plus 10 divided by all the pixels that are above threshold. In that case, that's 48. And similarly here, we take the, the sum of the pixels that are above threshold, in this case it's 14, divided by the sum of all the pixels uh, that are above threshold, which is 40. And so we get a value of 0.5 for this case and 0.35 for this other case. So notice a few important things. First, M1 is different from N2. There is more of channel one in the co-localized pixels 
Um, and so the reason for that is I made this example on purpose where a lot of the intensity in channel two is outside of the co-localizing area, which is why a minority of, of channel two is overlapping, is co-occurring with channel one. Uh, another important thing to notice is that Manders is different from the volume overlap. So the volume overlap here, it's two pixels out of uh, six that are overlapping, which would be 0.33, whereas here two pixels out of three are overlapping, which would be 0.67. So the reason the Manders is different from the volume overlap is because you can think of it, it's, it's weighted by the amount of stuff. Uh, and so that's why there is a difference. Um, so let's let's uh, discuss a few uh, a few uh, scenarios that are very common. So the first one is, what if I change the threshold just for channel one? What if I decide that I want to change the threshold? So let's say I change the threshold in channel one from five, you can see that on the left, to 11. So when I change the threshold in channel one, uh, now the only pixel that it's, that's above the threshold is this one, and that becomes the only pixel that's co-localized. And that changes both M1, so the fraction of channel 1 that's uh, co-localized with channel 2, and M2, the fraction of channel 2 that's co-localized with M1. And they are big changes. So this method is very sensitive to those thresholds. As a second example, imagine what would happen if the detector had a 10-unit offset. So this is a bit weird, but it's actually something uh, that's very common in any system that's based on a camera. Camera-based systems typically, uh, if they don't receive any light at all, they do not output a number that's zero. They output a number that's higher. In many cameras, it's around 100. In others, it's 400 to 500. And so um, if that number is comparable, to your signal, that will cause uh, some issues, which we'll see now, we'll explore now, by assuming that um, in this example, we had uh, the same the same sample, but it with a detector that had a 10 unit offset. So how do I uh, show that in this example? I just add 10 to each of the uh, pixel intensity. So where it was one, it's now 11, where it's zero, it's now 10, where it was six, it's now 16, and so on and so forth for both channels. Um, furthermore, uh, I can just shift the thresholds from 5 to 15 and from 6 to 16. Now, if I do that, uh, a sort of naive thought would be, well, you know, um, I did the same thing to both channels. It should all, you know, it should all kind of uh, cancel each other out. But that's not the case. So if you do the math, you'll see that's not the case. And I've done it explicitly here. And you'll see that both M1 and M2 change, and they don't even change in the same direction. So if you do not correct for this 10 unit offset, you will have uh, big changes in M1 and M2 relative to what this the sort of the real scenario would be, um, as shown on the left. And so, uh, just to to review, Manders, uh, the step one is to set thresholds for channel one and channel two. Pixels below thresholds are ignored. And step two is to calculate these coefficients of M1 and M2, which show the fraction of channel one that co-occurs with channel two and vice versa. And the problems, as I've illustrated, is that this technique is very sensitive to threshold values for channels, and that without a background correction, the values will be wrong if the background is large relative to the signal. So um, Another thing to keep in mind is that um, when you think about what you, you need to measure, uh, you can measure more than one thing, and measuring different things can provide different insights. So again, uh, in this review from Aaron and colleagues from 2018, they illustrated this by looking at the epidermal growth factor receptor, uh, and which is illustrated here uh, is marked in green. And in red, they looked at RAB13, and they measured uh, different metrics. So they measured Pearson's correlation coefficient, Spearman's correlation coefficient. Here you can see they're pretty high values, which suggests that there's some sort of concentration-dependent relationship between RAB13 and EGFR. They also looked at the um, Manders coefficient for EGFR and RAB13. So this is the fraction of EGFR that co-occurs with RAB13, and they saw a number near 1, which suggests that all of EGFR is trafficking through RAB13. Uh, but they also looked at RAB13 in EGFR, so the fraction of RAB13 that's in EGFR uh, that's co-occurring with it, and they, there was only like 40%-ish. And so that means that there's there are, like some of the RAB13 is associated with other things. It's not just associated with EGFR. Um, so you can see how measuring different things can provide different insights. Another example they showed is looking at total myosin and phosphorylated myosin. And there they saw that there was very little correlation uh, with the correlation coefficients, either Pearson's or Spearman's. So the level of one protein does not really predict the level of the other. They saw that 
the fraction of total myosin that is in phosphomyosin cases was about 70%. So this means that there's non-phosphorylated myosin in other locations. And then they also reported that there was the fraction of phosphorylated myosin in myosin was uh, 0.71. And this actually, to me, is, is very puzzling because I would have expected a number closer to one. I would have expected that if we're detecting all the myosin and the phosphorylated myosin, the phosphorylated myosin, uh, all of it should also be labeled by whatever we're using to label the myosin. So this is actually a very puzzling result, and I wonder if there, there wasn't some issue um, either with the sample preparation or maybe uh, with how the thresholding was done. Uh, I, I find this result a little bit puzzling. But you can see how uh, the more general point that measuring different things can provide different insights, I, I think, still stands. So we've, we've discussed what you measure, but the next question is, where do we measure? And we have discussed this a little bit so far implicitly that in some sense you measure in the thresholded pixels or you measure in regions of interest for cells or subregions of cells. What we haven't discussed so far is how do we set thresholds and how do we draw those regions of interest? So how do we find the quote right threshold? So there are many options and there are strong opinions about what are good or bad ways of doing this. I'm just gonna outline the different options and the, the strengths and weaknesses of each of those options. So one option is to, if you have an image, do this manually. So you manually decide on a threshold, so a pixel intensity value uh, above which you are going to include pixels and below which you are going to exclude pixels. And the higher the threshold, the fewer the number of included pixels there will be. Um, so the problem with this is it's subjective. And so what that means is that different people might come to different conclusions about what this will be. And so it'll be also maybe hard to replicate. And if you have many images, that scaling this approach to many images might be hard because if you're going to do it image by image, you have to do it image by image. That's very time consuming. And if you're going to use one value across all images, you sort of have to look at all the images at once. And so that is tractable if you have tens of images, but it might not be tractable if you have hundreds of images. And so this has uh, significant issues with it as an approach. Um, but sometimes you sort of you're stuck and you have to do uh, this because other approaches don't work. But let me let me go over a few of the other approaches. So another approach this was uh, proposed by Roman Giet, and I, I might be mangling his name, so apologies if that's the case. But this is a very kind of uh, nice approach where you do this automatically, and you do it automatically in a way that will give you the same threshold for all your images, and you base you determine what the threshold will be based on a, on a negative control where you decide on a tolerable number of false positive pixels in those negative controls. So you prepare negative controls and you image them with the same settings that you're gonna image your experiment. Uh, when you do that, you will generate a histogram where you have the number of pixels uh, as a function of pixel intensity. So this tells you uh, you know how many pixels there are with different intensities. And in a negative control, it might look something like this without any staining. And then in this uh, histogram, you define a fraction of false positive pixels that you're willing to accept based on that negative control. And that can be none at all. It can be you know, one in a million, one in a thousand, whatever. And so then you say, okay, I am willing to accept a certain fraction of false positive pixels. What's the threshold that gives me that fraction? So uh, here, I've, I've, uh, to make the, the graph clear, like this is clearly not 0.1% of, of this, but I've just made it that way so you can, you can see the concept illustrated. And so you get the threshold that would give that fraction of false positive pixels. Uh, typically, you, you do uh, this over several negative control images and average the result. And then you use that threshold for all images of samples acquired with the same settings. And nicely, this can be scripted. And so uh, Roman wrote, wrote a script, which is linked here. Um, and then when you look at the experimental condition with staining, these are the pixels that are above your threshold. So let me show you an explicit example of this. Uh, here, I, I, I used 0.1%. So one in a thousand pixels is my tolerable false positive um, pixels that I, a fraction that I would accept in negative controls. And so this is uh, staining with something called life act uh, that, that uh, highlights filamentous actin. And so on the left, I have negative controls where we didn't stain for it. On the right, I have uh, ones where, where it did have this life act molecule. And so if we look at this one, here is a histogram of the pixel intensities uh, in black. And the gray is the histogram on a log scale, which makes it easier to see the few pixels that have higher intensities. And so if we set uh, the threshold as 0.1% of all the pixels, uh, we get a value of 0.1%. 
208 as our threshold. If we repeat this for the other controls, we get values of 200, 250, we average them, we get 219. We apply that threshold to the actual experiment, where the, which are the images in the middle, and we get these as our thresholded pixels. And so then you have to you know, decide whether this makes sense for your sample. You know, maybe it's under detecting uh, or over detecting. So there will always be a quality control step where you know, even with an automatic method, you decide whether that method is giving you results that make sense. Um, so no, no matter what you do, there's an element of subjectivity that you sort of can't escape uh, at that quality control uh, step. But in any case, this is a pretty useful method uh, because it's based on uh, kind of negative controls. And so it might be a, a, a good method for your data set. Uh, another approach is to use an automatic method, but, but use the same algorithm for all your images. But, but this, this algorithm might give you a different threshold for each image. And so in Fiji, there are multiple global threshold algorithm options. And so in the exercise portion of this uh, co-localization um, uh, playlist and exercises, you'll see that we'll go over that in detail. Um, but so here are the different global threshold algorithm options in Fiji. And so you can see that some detect a lot of pixels. So those are probably a low threshold, whereas others detect almost none or maybe fewer pixels. And so the problems with this is that the choice between algorithms again is is subjective so you can again you can't escape the subjectivity you know you'll have to decide which algorithm makes the most sense for your data and that's a subjective choice you can read that there's there's good documentation of what the algorithms are doing but in the end you're going to have to look and see whether it makes sense for your data uh, thresholds on z stacks can actually give pretty weird results and during the exercise portion there's an i think there's an optional thing where i explore that in, in detail uh, and so finally, uh, thresholding in Fiji under some circumstances can depend on the brightness and contrast adjustments, which is, which is very confusing, at least to me, and uh, is something that I will sh uh, show a little bit more of in the exercise portion. So you have to be careful when you're doing this. Um, there's also local threshold algorithm options in Fiji where uh, the threshold is not the same value for every pixel in the image, but it's calculated based on uh, you know, local features uh, at each pixel. And so here this has, uh, you know, for, for this particular data set, it doesn't give a good result. I just wanted to illustrate it, but it has the same problem as the using a global thresholding algorithm, which is you have to pick the algorithm and that decision is subjective. And then uh, it also requires additional decisions for data conversion, at least in Fiji, because these local thresholding algorithms only operate in 8-bit. And so if you don't have 8-bit data, you have to do a conversion. You have to decide how to do that conversion. And furthermore, there are decisions about what counts as local. Uh, so you have to decide what your radius of action of sort of uh, localness is. And so you, you just add more decisions and more complications. But in some cases, this may be the right approach for your data. Um, Another very popular method in the literature, at least, is Costas thresholding. So I'll spend some time explaining what this is. This is, uh, was developed in 2004. Uh, so you have some data. Uh, you assume that there's a linear correlation between channel one and channel two, and you actually fit a line to it uh, using a, a very particular uh, fitting method. Um, and then you go down that line, and as you go down that line, you calculate the Pearson's correlation coefficient. And you keep doing that going down the line. So for example, if you look at this point in the line, the Pearson's correlation coefficient is 0.4. If you look at this point, it's 0.25. And at some point, you typically reach a place where uh, for that value of um, intensity in the red and the green channel and channel one and channel two, uh, the Pearson's correlation coefficient of the points below that is zero. And so that is then what you set as your threshold. Uh, the problem with this method is that, uh, again, the assumption of a linear correlation is not necessarily valid. It's very sensitive to ROI placement, like any correlation method, and ROI placement is hard to automate. And furthermore, uh, this may not be obvious, but you need to use the proper Fiji implementation. Uh, so Fiji has several plugins that can calculate uh, co-localization thresholds. Uh, to my knowledge, as of May of 20. 24, only coloc2 and biobjective give the proper results, uh, whereas the colocalization threshold method does not. So you have to be careful with this uh, because there are some subtleties uh, with uh, how you draw this line, uh, this sort of linear fit that can screw up some of the implementations of this. And uh, in, this, in the slides, which I will provide, um, 
as, as, as part of this, this lecture and this sort of co-localization training module, there's further reading that you can do if you're interested uh, on why some of the Fiji implementations are incorrect. Um, so if you're thresholding in 3D data sets, that requires additional decisions. So will you threshold based on one slice? If so, which one? Are you going to take the brightest slice? What does brightest mean? Is it, you know, how do you define that? Is it the slice with the brightest pixels or is it the slice with the highest average brightness? Those are different things. And so if you want to do this systematically, you have to decide which of those to do. Are you instead going to threshold based on a maximum projection image? That might be acceptable in some cases. In others, it might lead you astray. Are you going to threshold based on a histogram of the entire stack? That might be a good decision. In others, it might be computationally expensive and uh, not give you much better result. So you'll have to try these things um, and make decisions as to how you're going to do the thresholding if you have a three-dimensional data set. Um, when you're doing thresholding, and you're using usually many images because you're not just going to look at co-localization in one image. You want statistics. How do you keep things consistent? So I've just sort of discussed some of the ways you can do it. You can use the same automatic method across different images. And that method uh, might give you different results for each image, but it'll be the same method. You can perhaps average the automatic method results across images. In some cases, that might be a good idea. In other cases, that might be a terrible idea. Um, you can use. Uh, the automatic method across a montage of images. So in some cases that works, in other cases it doesn't. Um, if you're doing manual thresholding, you can use uh, the same manual threshold across all the images, or perhaps you want the same person doing manual thresholding. Uh, and that might be different across all images, but at least it's the same person doing it. All of these have uh, you know, obvious problems. Uh, and we'll discuss them more uh, during the exercise portion of this. But um, there are really a lot of decisions that you need to make to, to find some way of keeping things consistent to the best of your abilities. Um, once you decide on the thresholding, how do we check that it actually worked well across our entire data set? Maybe it works well on half the data, but on others, maybe if you're using an automatic thresholding method, it fails horribly. And so for this, the montage option in Fiji is very useful, where you can look at multiple images sort of side by side and overlay the thresholds that you found on those. And you can see whether they make sense to you or not. Um, another important decision that you need to make is whether you're going to measure things per cell or per image. So Per cell measurements make more biological sense, but they require either one image per cell or one region of interest per cell. And then we get into all the problems for how do you draw the regions of interest. So how do we draw the regions of interest? So you can draw them manually. That's going to be somewhat subjective uh, because it depends on you know where each person decides where the edges of the cells are. It'll scale poorly because it's literally a person drawing them, which is slow. And it's very hard to do this in three dimensions. So there are ways uh, with certain softwares, but it's not particularly easy. Um, so the scaling is even worse if you're trying to draw in 3D. Um, if you draw them automatically, um, you know, with certain techniques that might work okay, but it might actually force you to use another channel to mask the cells uh, and use that for segmentation and drawing regions of interest of the entire cells. So uh, an important point is once we measure co-localization, what do we compare it to? So the best option, in my opinion, is to compare it to different experimental conditions. So examples of this can be biological positive and negative controls, proteins that we know do or do not overlap, a drug treatment, the passage of time, something that changed the sample. Um, so let me show you an example of this with Manders. This is a, a, a paper from 2011 where they were looking at the co-occurrence of the ER and mitochondria. And they saw that when they added to Nicomycin, Manders, correlation, uh, uh, Manders coefficient went up. So clearly there was a change here. Uh, notice that it's not particularly important what this number was. What's important is that they co-occurred more in the presence of two Nicomycin, and that was uh, true for both the, the co-occurrence of ER with mitochondria and of mitochondria for ER. Um, similarly, this is an example for Pearson's where they were looking at the correlation between vinculin and different interacting proteins. And so for vinculin and talin, uh, the Pearson's correlation coefficient was quite high, but for vinculin and alpha-actin, and even though you can see that they're clearly co-occurring in some of the same spots, the correlation between the intensities was much lower. So the nice thing about these, doing these comparisons is that it doesn't really matter too much what the values are, you're looking for differences. And because like the values, it can be hard to interpret like what, what is a lot, what is not a lot, um, 
these comparisons, I feel, are much stronger um, and, and, and are the way that these experiments, if possible, should be designed. Um, another option that I consider much worse is to compare things to a randomized version of your image. So maybe you don't have a control, maybe that's not possible. And so the idea is you randomize the image and compare whatever you measure to that randomized version. So examples of randomization can be rotating the image of one channel, randomizing all the pixels, randomizing groups of pixels that have a point spread function size. So uh, optically, pixels that are next to each other are typically correlated. And so randomizing all of them doesn't make much sense. You know, uh, So you can randomize little blocks of pixels. And um, the, finally, you can randomize within regions of interest. And I'll explain why this is important in a moment. So let me show you this version of the randomized image where you rotate it. Um, so this is uh, you know, a, a, a two-channel image. And so the, the, these top three images this is the, re the original data. So you measure whatever your co-localization parameter is here. And then you rotate the image of channel one. And you measure your co-localization parameter here. And so the idea is if the co-localization is real, you expect a lower co-localization measurement in the rotated condition. So this sounds pretty straightforward, but there's an obvious problem, which is when you rotate channel one, some of the channel one intensity ends up in places where there are no cells. So that makes absolutely no cells, no sense. Even if the channel one protein in this case were distributed randomly, it would never be outside the cell. And so this is kind of a general problem that many or most randomization schemes typically underestimate the overlap in the randomized condition, because when they randomize, they put things in places where biologically they would never be. The best version of this is something that uh, Costas developed. So this is not the Costas' thresholding. This is Costas randomization. And you can randomize the pixels in PSF size chunks in regions of interest. So the idea is you chunk the image into PSF size blocks so that you maintain uh, correlations that you know will be there optically. And you randomize the position of blocks in one channel. In this case, we're randomizing um, the, the, the green channel in, in this one here only inside the region of interest. You measure the co-localization parameter. You repeat the randomization. And you measure the co-localization parameter. And you do this over and over. So you measure a distribution of what the co-localization parameter value would be under the assumption of the random distribution of the protein. Once you've done that, you measure the actual co-localization parameter in the actual data. And because you have a distribution, you can uh, <clears throat> sort of infer what the probability is of this occurring. And if it's you know very low, then that suggests that you actually do have uh, uh, kind of co-localization between the channels. Uh, the problem is that if the green protein in this case cannot be everywhere with the same probability in the region of interest, which in this case is a cell, you will underestimate the co-localization under the random condition. You will tend to detect things as significant when they're not. And so the obvious example here is it's not clear to me that the green protein can really be in the nucleus. It doesn't really seem to be there at a very high intensity. And so by allowing it to randomly sample that, we're going to make it more likely that we'll find things that are significant when maybe they're not. Um, so once we make all these decisions and analyze our data, it's worth asking, how robust are our conclusions to slightly different decisions? And so I'll show you an example of how to evaluate that. Uh, but so the general point is, Maybe tweak your analysis a little bit, and if everything falls apart, that means that you, um, you know your conclusions were really not robust to all those decisions you made. So I'm going to make uh, I'm going to go into an example from a collaboration I had with Jenny Ting's lab uh, here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. <clears throat> this was in a paper published in 2019 where we had uh, biochemistry that suggested that a protein called Sting was interacting with a protein con called NLRC3, and that in the presence of DNA, uh, this interaction was abrogated. So uh, we wanted to study this um, using imaging to see what might be happening uh, to these proteins in the cell. And we made the following decisions. We did 3D confocal microscopy with a high NA objective using Alexa Fluor 546 and 488. We didn't do any background subtraction. We didn't do any deconvolution. We analyzed on three-dimensional stacks. We analyzed per image and not per cell. We did manual thresholding, looking at the slice with the brightest average intensity from each stack across all images. And we used the same threshold for all the images. And we did 40 images from each condition. And the thing that we measured was the thresholded Manders coefficient for NLRC3 and Sting. So that was the thing that was biologically interesting. Now, all of these decisions are debatable. Um, but these were the decisions that we made. And I'll show you that um, they were actually 
quite robust. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of, of these images. And so in, in terms of the diagram, Sting is sort of the red one and LRC3 is the green one. And then HSV60 is the DNA that binds an LRC3. And then we measured the percent of NLRC3 co-localizing with Sting. And we saw that it was, you know, whatever the value was before adding DNA. And when we added DNA, that dropped significantly. So um, an important point uh, to, to call back to something I was mentioning before was is robustness. And so what we saw, um, and this we, we didn't do in the paper, we did it later, is that if you look at the differences between the groups, we measured this here with a particular threshold for one of the channels and the others, which is this one. If you start to change those thresholds and run the analysis again and calculate the delta for that rerun analysis, you can generate this sort of phase plot where you see what is the delta for different combinations of thresholds. And if you, you can see that if you move it by as much as 25%, you're still in a condition where the delta, like the wild type minus is bigger than the wild type plus, and you only like invert that relationship if you have these very, very high thresholds for channel two. Uh, similarly, if you look at the p-values of this comparison, even if you move it around by the thresholds by 25% and redo the analysis over and over again, you're still falling below the sort of generally accepted value of p equals 0 0.05. So really the results are very robust to changes in the threshold. And as you'll see in the exercises, they are also robust to changes in in thresholding methods and also like the exact data that you use. This is was all done in 3D data sets. There's an exercise portion associated with this co-localization lecture where everything was done in 2D and you'll see that the results come out the same. Um, uh, an important point is we, we did a lot of trying to document what, what, what we were doing. So the imaging and analysis were explained in some detail. Um, this paper was from several years ago. I think we could have done a better job if we had done it today. Uh, we, we could have done a better job describing filters and lasers. We, we weren't explicit in, in the methods that we were in the figure legends about the exact co-localization metric that we use. And uh, again, if we had to do it today, I think we'd make more of an effort to share the data and analysis macros systematically. Um, but we did, you know, a reasonable job. Uh, here's now how not to report what you did. This is from a paper published in Nature this year, where this is the extent of the description of the imaging and analysis methods, where they just use some microscopes and some software and they explain nothing. And so, you know, after, you know, listening uh, to this lecture, you see the number of decisions that were made and those really matter and so they, they matter for interpreting the results and so uh, i don't think that this is a uh, you know this is what you want to do and so it's pretty easy to document what you did better uh, on the website from the core facility that i direct uh, there's extensive information on what to report in materials and methods there are links to these very nice papers which also uh, make very similar points of what what you should and shouldn't report and here are some other uh, papers that discuss how to report how you did your image analysis. Um, so some take home messages. Uh, you will have to make decisions if you do co-localization analysis. I highly recommend that you compare to different experimental conditions and not to some random image. Um, test your decisions. So make the decisions, test them, and then iterate to optimize those decisions. Don't assume that you're going to get it right on the first try. Do some pilot experiments, kick the tires on it, see how it goes, and then um, modify things as needed. Document your decision so that other people can understand what you did. Uh, and then finally, uh, kind of a more meta point, but beware of subjectivity laundering. There's a lot of hidden decisions and assumptions, even in the objective methods. Uh, a notable example is thresholding. You might use an automatic method, which sounds very objective, but you chose that automatic method. And so um, you can't escape that you're going to make some decisions. And so you just want to do the best that you can. A few useful references that I've found for, for further reading uh, are those two reviews. Uh, Roman Guillet had a very nice online presentation um, that's related to this plugin called Biop Jacob, which we will use extensively in the exercise portion. Uh, and then Pete Bankhead's introduction to bioimage analysis, I think, is, is fantastic. And it has a very nice discussion of, of the different thresholding methods uh, that you have as options.